if you could talk to me a little bit, within the last couple of days, you all released the domestic violence fatality report for 2020. Talk to me about that report, even if it's just in your office putting it together, some of the biggest things that stood out to you or if you ever were shocked by what you were seeing. The effort to put together a domestic violence fatality review board is an important and it's a harrowing exercise. Every life that we lose to domestic violence is a tragedy. And every time we lose someone to domestic violence, we need to ask the question, what happened? What could we have done differently? Each year, some themes come through that aren't surprises anymore. A big one is we lose people mostly who die with a firearm being involved. Making a big question for our agenda is how do we prevent known perpetrators of domestic violence from having access to firearms. And last year, we got a new law passed related to the protection order system so we could better remove firearms from people who might well take the lives of another person. With that one, would that be the red flag law and pertaining to this in instance? If you could just, you know, quickly expand upon that. In Colorado, we have a general red flag law that applies to any situation, including domestic violence, meaning if there's a significant risk of someone being injured or killed, you can actually remove a firearm. And domestic violence is a such situation that we know that can happen in. There's actually a specific law in the domestic violence context. When you have evidence of domestic violence, one of the requirements is often the, perp the alleged perpetrator is told to relinquish their firearms. Previous to last year, the law was flawed. It didn't apply to boyfriend-girlfriend situations, and there was no real teeth to make sure the firearms were relinquished. And so we fixed that last year. This being something that was just implemented last year, however, these 63 domestic violence deaths relate back to 2020, and also the stat of there being, I believe it was in maybe 54% of the incidents, they were firearms were used. I'm sure you're hoping that this law will reflect upon the numbers once you all get ready to do this report for the year of 2021. Our goal is for both our red flag law and our specific domestic violence protection order law to reduce the number of gun violence deaths in domestic violence. The law we passed last year is just going into effect now. The red flag law is still getting known by people. So we have work to do to use these tools to protect victims and save lives. 63 domestic violence deaths in the year 2020, slightly down from the year before. However, it was the second highest total over the last five years. What does that tell you? We are living in a time of great trauma. We're living in a time when we know there's a lot of suffering out there. When some people endure trauma, it ends up coming out in abusive ways. People who aren't able to work through how they're feeling, who are engaging in destructive, dangerous behavior. We also are in a pandemic when a lot of people are not necessarily as known by others, and thus the warning signs that we might get about domestic violence may not be happening. And so we have to better learn about these signs when they're happening. We have to help people before it's too late. And these high numbers we're seeing, they concern me. Are you even more concerned about the next report that will come out and knowing that that will be a full year of the pandemic 2021? You know, you've already talked about 2020 being one of those years where you all saw the second highest numbers. Who knows what 2021 is going to bring a full year of a pandemic when so many people were working from home, locked up inside their homes and having no way to let out a lot of that anger or frustration, even if they turn toward resources. I worry about what 2021 has been like for domestic violence, for people who die by suicide, for people who die by drug overdose. We're getting some only anecdotal information now. It'll take a while before we have the total picture. But from what we're seeing in all these areas, it's scary. And it shows us we've got important work to do to protect people. Talk about anecdotal information. I want to tell you two of the stories that I'm working on, both in Arapahoe County both of these incidents last year. One incident, woman shot and killed after she was picked up from work by her husband. Her husband then turned the gun on himself and committed suicide. 
she leaves behind a 21-year-old son and a 26-year-old son who are now dealing with this. He left behind a 16-year-old daughter who is now dealing with this. You then have another situation where a woman was stabbed between 50 and 100 times while her 15-year-old daughter was downstairs listening to her mom beg for help. Mm -hmm. She's talking. Her two older brothers are talking. The ex-husband is also talking who filed a restraining order against the man who killed his former wife. Those are two incidents from last year that will be in the report when, once, it, once the re review board puts it together. How do those two incidents strike you? Last year, we spent a lot of time talking about the impact on children. Part of what we don't think about enough in society is how trauma reverberates. So we hear about these domestic violence deaths and we mourn the loss of life. Last year's report, we focused on another critical issue. The survivors, including child survivors, who live with that trauma, they deserve our support as well. And we need to do better on the front end, prevention, seeing the warning signs, intervening before it's too late, and on the back end, supporting survivors and victims who weren't necessarily physically harmed, but emotionally are scarred for life. Talk to me about the resources to help heal those scars. There are a range of resources that are available. The critical resource I want people to know about is if you, a loved one, a friend, someone you know, is currently a victim of domestic violence, there are resources across our state shelters, including here in Denver, the Rose Andam Center, Safe House in Boulder, uh, et cetera, where if you show up, people will protect you. That's the most critical resource. There are also resources for people who have witnessed, endured, and experienced the reverberations of domestic violence as well. And part of what we need to do as a society is get past the stigma a lot of the reason that people don't talk about domestic violence is they are ashamed. They are afraid they're going to be judged. And we have to get better at telling one another we know that lots of people are suffering and that we're here to support one another. Phil, in those two stories I just told you about, <clears throat> some of the findings in the report outline exactly what happened in this situation. And one of them, it's kind of a reversal. It says 60% are financially dependent, and I believe in the report it said that, you know, 60% of the perpetrators may be financially dependent on the victims. Let's flip that. 60% of the victims being financially dependent on the perpetrator, one being able to talk about that because that was the case in one of my stories. In another story, 66% pending legal action. She had just filed the paperwork for a divorce on a Sunday and was murdered at the end of the week couple of points that are important. If you're suffering, if you know someone's suffering in a situation where domestic violence is happening, you can't solve this on your own. Filing for divorce could be putting your life in jeopardy. The legal system has protections, the protective order system I mentioned, that can help people. You need legal help to do this in a way that you're not going to be as vulnerable to being killed as we know happens. And there are resources out there to help you. Another point that you make that's also really important is the issue around the financial relationships. And a lot of times people are trapped or feel trapped because they say, well, what would I do financially if I were to try to leave? The resources available can help people, can support people to get through that scary period. What people who are suffering from domestic violence need to know is you could be one of these stories in the report if you don't get help before it's too late. And the families that I'm speaking to are anxiously waiting for the report at the end of the year because they know that their loved ones will be named in it. That's an important point for us to be aware of, is victims, survivors, want to be acknowledged. They want their stories acknowledged. We need to acknowledge what happens, how it happens, and we need to tell victims that we're going to do all we can to prevent future people from ending up in this situation.
you all are doing a lot to try to prevent these things, and I believe there were a few recommendations within the report, um, especially based on some of the evidence that you all have been able to find, especially when it comes down to um, improving kind of that economic stability for victims and for perpetrators, if you can kind of expand on that. We need to make sure that resources exist so that when someone is worried, I'm not gonna have a place to live if I try to protect me and my family from a domestic violence perpetrator, that we have options. I believe current facilities, shelters, have access to those resources, and we need to redouble our efforts to make sure that people don't end up regretting getting help that takes them out of a situation and making sure that we give people those resources to protect them, and that's one of the key findings in this report. Another key point I want to make is that this Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board isn't authorized by law past this year. And we want to keep doing this work because we believe you're not going to improve unless you know what went wrong and why. And so we're committed to that exercise. We're committed to learning from tragedy and doing all we can to prevent it. If you could talk to me about um, going into some of the recommendations. Um, if you could talk to me a little bit, I know that there was something else mentioned in there about some of the jail-based sentences or pre-release with providing the risk assessments. If you could maybe go into that a little bit, um, especially you know this being one of those things where it is kind of offering and providing resources for those on both ends and also trying to handle the situation before it gets to the point where someone is physically assaulted or someone has lost their life? One of the risky time periods is when the legal system intervenes and someone is arrested for assault against a spouse or a loved one. When the legal system takes someone into jail, there's a big question. Will that person remain in jail while the charges are pending or will they be let out? We need to make sure we have effective risk assessment so that anyone who's accused of domestic violence will stay in jail unless we're comfortable that they're not going to take action against a victim. If they are let out, there should be a protective order, there should be a removal of firearms, and there should be vigilant oversight so that we're not putting a victim in danger. And if we have significant enough concerns, we should not let people out of jail pending the actual criminal trial because those risks we know from experience can be grave. How are you all working with local court systems um, on the local and the state level to ensure that this isn't happening because I believe in a lot of these situations most people will be scared to talk to someone because if this person gets arrested, if something happens, and they know I went to the police, they may come back and harm me. They may come back and kill me because I've said something. And sometimes it's that that can spark the perpetrator to be able to act violently against the victim. We have to be able to tell victims that we are going to protect them, and then we actually have to protect them. If people are speaking up and they themselves become a target as a result of it, that sets back our work that's just wrong. So that means that we need our system to work fairly and with the concerns of the victims in mind. We are working to train and develop more awareness about how to approach domestic violence, including working on this topic of lethality assessment so that we're working with law enforcement to understand what constitutes a severe risk. What signs do we look for? A lot of times law enforcement may not recognize the severity of domestic violence. They not, may not see it as a threat. The better we can educate law enforcement, the better we can work together, the better we can address this threat and save lives. I spoke with the victim's advocate the other day and she brought this up and I specifically wanted to ask you this. Um, we always hear about this, whether it's in hospitals, whether it's at um, different treatment centers for people who may be dealing with something. She talks about the lack of beds. You know, you can easily speak with a, a victim of domestic violence who may come to you for help when they need help in that moment in time because we know a lot of times in a lot of situations they may not come to you in advance they come to you when it's bad at that moment and they need help right away 
you may want to lead them to a shelter and you do and you've gained their trust to where they are calling you for help at this point you pick up the phone and call a shelter there is no bed available for this person that you have tried to help for so long who has finally broken down and fallen into your arms you have to tell them there's no bed available how how does that sit with you and you know even more so what's being done on the state level to ensure that that's not happening for these people who are vulnerable when they come for help that is one of the warning signs in this report that a lack of resources for people who are struggling economically is a critical reason why people end up getting killed that's unacceptable we can't allow people who come forward to be told I'm sorry we can't support you you're on your own because then if they are killed that's on us as a society for not doing better. So we're committed in this report to fight for those resources and to look into what we need to be doing so we give people an alternative and they're not actually trapped. If there is anything you could do today as the Attorney General of this state to be able to fight domestic violence even harder than what your office is doing today, if you could implement something by 5 p.m., what would it be? I would work on changing a culture. We have a culture of silence, often where people are suffering in shame. If we know more about people who are hurting and people who are told know what they can do, they know the resources out there, we have two problems. We need more resources and we need more people to know that there are resources out there. I am as worried about both of those two problems and if you first don't know about people who are hurting who could benefit the resources, then having the resources doesn't matter. So if I could change one thing, I'd, I'd change the culture of silence that too many victims suffer in. You talk about the culture of silence, yet I am still baffled that I have two families who are willing to speak to me about what they've gone through, even children, about the loss of their parents. What's your response to that? They have my utter and sincere respect and appreciation. I have heard from people in the past who have lost loved ones and have taken that loss and have turned it into purpose to help others. And so I, I'd like to thank them for their bravery. I'd like to involve them in the work we're doing. And I'd like to tell them that their experience is one that we want to do all we can to prevent others from having to endure. Definitely one family is starting a foundation in their loved one's name to prevent this from happening to other people who may be in a situation where they feel financially comfortable yet scared to walk away. Um, last question, I think this may be the final one that I may have for you. When you hear the term domestic violence, when, you, when the review board starts to work on this report, once this report is released, what are the things that come to mind, even if that's just when you see the numbers, even that's when you hear the word domestic violence, or even when you hear about the kids who are being left behind in these incidents? That we are living with a tragedy that happens on a regular basis, that we're losing people because we have failed as a society to be able to step in before it's too late. We can and we will and we must do better to save lives. We've had in the last few years record levels of domestic violence deaths. That is a call to action. We intend to do all we can to answer that call. Is there anything else you would like to add that I didn't ask you in general about this topic, about this story, anything personal? We in Colorado are at our best when we're supporting one another. I know it. I see it in the fires in Boulder, how much we care about one another. Another area that we can and need to care about one another is in the area of domestic violence, where by being better friends, neighbors, coworkers, we can learn about people's suffering and help them get the assistance they need before it's too late.